Amen. So, if you are married or engaged or have a boyfriend or girlfriend, do you remember who said, I love you first? Now, I'm not going to go around and call on people because I don't want to get anybody in trouble. But I want you to think about it. I want you to think about it because sometimes that's this beautiful moment when you share your heart. And then I have a family member who was uh, with a, a wonderful young lady, and she said, I love you. And his response was, thanks. <laughs> he wasn't quite ready to say it back to her yet. If you've made it to that point, uh, maybe, maybe you remember that. Maybe you remember that. You know, we're talking tonight as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper about the, lo the Lord first loving us. Why do you follow the Lord? You know, why do you follow the Lord? Why do you come to church? You know, why do you read the Bible? And why do, we, why do you serve others? Why do we deny ourselves some comfort and some ease and some pleasure? Why do we say no to some of those things? You know, there's a lot of different reasons, motivation, that people do stuff for church. One of them, and it's not a very good motivation, but it is one, is fear. If I don't do this, God will be mad at me, right? If I don't do this, the pastor is going to chase me down, right? He's going to call me up and be like, where were you, right? That's, that's one of those motivations, and it's not a particularly good motivation, but uh, you probably had that stage in life where you felt like I got to do that or else. And then there's duty, right? And duty is I'm doing this because I'm supposed to do this. Right? This is what's right, and whether I particularly feel like it or not, I committed to it, or I know it's the right thing to do, so I'm going to show up and do it. Duty is not a terrible reason to serve the Lord, but there are better reasons than that to follow the Lord. And that's really what brings us to the motivation of love. Not in order, we don't serve the Lord in order to get something, we serve him because of what he's done for us. We don't love him in order to get him to do something for us. We love him because of what he's done for us. You know, that is one of the greatest misunderstandings that people have about Christ and salvation is they think that we are here on a Sunday night, on Halloween evening, dressed up, and I love all of your costumes. You've all dressed up as church people, right? That's great, except for one angel and one unicorn. Right? I think we got Spider-Man back there, too. I'm not entirely sure. Spider-Man back there? There he is. We got Spider-Man back there. I dressed up as a Baptist preacher. So that's pretty good. Randy dressed up as a missionary. So, so that's... <laughs> but you're here, right? You're here in God's house. Why, why, why are you here? Why are you doing this? And we're not doing this in order to try and get to heaven. But there are people who think that's why we're here tonight. You know, some of you, you go out of, out of your way to help other people, whether it's uh, the homeless and trying to make food and care for them, whether it's generosity and giving to help missions uh, around the world, whether it's serving the young people here in our church or serving our, the, the senior saints and some of the people that are more homebound. Some of you visit folks in nursing homes and someone might say, oh, you're doing that because you want to go to heaven and you're trying to earn your way to heaven. And we would turn that around on its head, and we would say, no, I'm doing that because I'm already on my way to heaven. I'm not doing that to try and get God to love me. I'm doing that because he already loves me, and I'm returning that love. I'm returning that love. So how do we not let our love grow cold, right? You've, you've been there before, haven't you? If you've followed the Lord for any length of time, there were times when you were so excited about the things of God, about church, and you couldn't wait to get there, and you were reading your Bible, and you were praying, and you were listening to good music. I mean, it was just, it was a huge part of your life. And then there's other times where you're like, church again? Is it Sunday already? And it's almost like a slog, and you think, I haven't really read my Bible, and, and I know I ought to, and I haven't really done this, and I know I ought to. What, what has happened there? And is there something we can do in order to rekindle that love or to love him more? Sometimes the simplest verses have the greatest riches inside of them if we'll mine them out. So before we observe the Lord's Supper tonight, let's mine some treasure together in 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 19. 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 19. The Word of God says this, We love him 
because he first loved us. I'm going to read that one more time. We love him because he first loved us. Let's pray together. Father, the the simplicity of this verse is almost hard to explain, and so I pray that you would help us to get all out of it that you want us to have tonight. Give me clarity of thought and speech and the working of your spirit in me and also in all those under the sound of my voice that we might hear and understand. In Jesus' name, amen. John, the apostle, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, is the human penman for this. We know it's the spirit of God who's the author. And he lived a very long time, and he ended up writing different epistles or letters, and he was dealing with some of the problems of his day, bad doctrine, things being taught that weren't true, that people got confused about. And so he came back to some of the most important foundational principles, and he's talking about the love of God and God being love, and he says this very basic but essential statement, that we love him, why? Because he first loved us. You know, when it says that he loved us, what is this referring to? Well, in John chapter 3 and verse number 16, which you could probably quote by memory, many of us, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved and it moved him to action. In fact, I would argue that this kind of love can't just stay inside of your own head or your own heart and be this kind of love. This is the perfect, self-sacrificing, acting love of God. And it says that he so loved the world that he gave, that he gave his son. So when it says back in 1 John that we love him because he first loved us, that's The great act of God's love is the giving of his son to us. That's what we remember when we observe the Lord's Supper. That's what we celebrate when we think about what he's done for us and what he will do for us. And ironically, though God did this great act of love in giving his own son, was the world happy about it? No. Look in in John chapter 1, excuse me. John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, it says in verse number 10, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The Lord Jesus, God the Son, became a man without ceasing to be God, and he lived among what should have been a welcoming chosen people. But they did not all welcome him, did they? A lot of people were threatened by him. A lot of people were confused by him. A lot of people had other expectations of what the Messiah, the great deliverer, would act like and speak like and look like. And so they did not receive him, and yet God still sent his son. How many of you know that God was already aware that he would not be received when he came as the Lord Jesus. How many of you already know that that happened? That he, he knew. He knew that they would have a hard time with that. You see, the Lord Jesus, it says, was light. And the darkness couldn't grasp it, couldn't get itself around it. It comprehended it not. The Bible says that men love darkness rather than light. And it's kind of like when you turn a light on in some place, it's kind of dirty, and the, the cockroaches scatter because they don't like that. That's sort of what it's like. We don't really want the bad things that we do to have light shown on them. We'd much rather keep them hidden. We'd much rather keep them hidden. So that's why a lot of people didn't like Jesus, because when he came speaking truth, it stepped all over their toes and got into their business. And so God knew that he wouldn't be well received, and yet he did it anyway. One of the most amazing things about God's love is that it's not because we were lovely. God did not love us because we were lovely. He loved us because he is love. It's causeless. Isn't that weird? Now, some of you who have poured out your love before and you went through that stage of writing poetry for that special somebody, and I mean, you just, it was there and you loved them. You loved them. You had all these reasons why you loved them, didn't you? It was her smile. It it was the way he looked at you. 
It was, it was uh, her voice when you heard her sing. It was uh, the way that he was so faithful and diligent or kept his word. I don't know all of the reasons why you ended up being there, but there were things that you loved about them. And that brought you to love them. But God looked at us, knew all of the bad with what little good there was and still loved us anyway. This is not a message to beat us up and talk about how bad we are. It's just to put it in perspective that the Lord knew the worst about us and still loved us anyway. When you got married, if you did indeed get married already, you probably discovered some things about your spouse that you didn't know beforehand. Things that perhaps love blinded you to, or maybe it was infatuation that they blinded you to. Uh, and and that's, that's where you get, some of you looked at each other just now, right? Some of you looked at each other and you're rehearsing things like, uh, they never put the seat down, and why doesn't the cap go back on the toothpaste? And no, we buy Crest. No, we buy Colgate toothpaste. You know, uh, why? W no, we need the double-plied toilet paper. No, we need the cheapest toilet paper because it's just toilet paper. You know, all of the little things, and then the way that we lose our temper and the annoying little things that we do, it, it, you start to realize those the more you get to know somebody. And part of loving somebody is to choose to continue to love them in spite of their failures, in spite of their faults, in spite of the times that they come short. You choose to love them anyway. And the Lord knew all of those things ahead of time. I hope that you would also make the choice that you've made, especially if you're still married to that person, and you would go through with it again, even knowing all of this. But the Lord knew the worst of it and still went to the cross for us. Look in 1 John, back in 1 John chapter 4, in verse number 10. You want to know what love is? In 1 John chapter 4, in verse number 10. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation meaning the way by which our sins are forgiven. That's what Jesus was. He, he stepped into that place, satisfied God's wrath against sin, and now we can have the forgiveness of sins. That's what love was. Not that we loved him, but he loved us. You know, it's, it's amazing to think about how God pursued us before we got saved. I, I don't know. Some people think, well, I chose the Lord. Well, long before you chose the Lord, he was after you. He was after you. He was working in the circumstances of your life. He was bringing the right people across your paths. He was removing the things that needed to be removed so that you would be ready to receive him. He went to great lengths for each of us that know the Lord to come to know him. And all of it was that loving wooing that he was doing, the drawing by his spirit that we might come to trust him as savior. You know, we can be selfish and we can be petty and we can be rebellious. And yet God sent his son for us. God loved us. We're supposed to love God in return. The greatest commandment, the Lord said, revolve around love. You say, which of the Ten Commandments is the greatest? That was a big debate in the day of the Lord Jesus' ministry, and there were lots of different answers about that, and people had different... It was like one of those theological debates that people like to have. And so Jesus answered something that put everybody on notice. Look in Matthew 22. In Matthew chapter 22... You know, they were all trying to ask Jesus questions, by the way, to get him in trouble. He had people that were trying to trip him up publicly so that he would say something that would either get him in trouble with this group or with that group. And he always answered so wisely. Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 36. Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. He says everything is dependent upon this, that you love God with everything that is in you and that you love your neighbor as yourself. Everything else stems and flows from these things. If you don't have these things, you won't be able to do the other things because they all hang upon it. You know, when you do something for the Lord, what goes on in your head as you're doing it? Do you ever think about it as you're trying to serve the Lord or you're trying to do something that's difficult? 
Does it ever go through your head and, and you say, you know, I can't believe I have to do this again. And how did I get to be lobby usher again? Sorry, lobby usher, whoever's out there. I'm not sure who's out there right now today. Hopefully they can hear me. Right. Who is it? Bill Johnson. Yeah, he, he's out there today. I want you to think about times when you serve the Lord and you were consciously doing it out of love for him. And you say, Lord, I'm doing this for you. I'm doing this for you. You say, does it have to be some great thing like, Lord, I'm feeding the orphans for you. Sometimes we think it has to be something that self-sacrificing and that, that virtuous. But it could be something as simple as, Lord, I, I'm, I'm getting my Sunday school lesson together for these little ones for you. I'm, I'm choosing to serve in the nursery out of love for you. Lord, you care for me so greatly, I'm going to try and care for these children in a great way because of what you've done for me. It is a, a dialogue, a way that we choose to do something. We, we obey him out of love. You know, I want to do things for my wife, not because I'm afraid of what she'll do to me if I don't do them. Okay, there's a little bit of that, but only a very small amount. I don't do that for her just because it's my duty and say, well, you asked me to do this, so I guess because I'm your husband, I have to, right? That usually does not does not go over so hot either. Because I love her, that's the greatest motivation I could have to do something to help her. And in the same way, on a much higher level, that's how we have to look at it with the Lord. I remember um, as an intern here at the church with Pastor Jenkins over the summer that we, before we had everything paved over here and that, he wanted to build a gravel drive into this new woods area that the church had purchased. It's not new anymore. It's probably like 15 years ago, but we wanted to build that. And so we built a gravel road that summer uh, with a wheelbarrow and shovels, right? We didn't, we didn't have the machinery to just do that. So we, we put the, and you know what? I had to get to the place where I wasn't doing it because I thought the road was a good idea. And I, I had to get to the place where I wasn't doing it for Alan Jenkins. I had to build that road for the Lord Jesus Christ. I had to do that. I had to get to that place. And it made all the difference. It changed my whole mindset towards it. Because now, however I do that, reflects on what I think about God. Same thing when I'm the, the husband that I ought to be at home, at least try to be. When I'm the father that I ought to be, at least I, I try to be at home. I do those things not for my kids, not for my wife, though she almost always deserves it. My kids, mm, you sort of deserve it most of the time but the Lord always deserves it. And so I do it for him out of my love for him. You know, we should, we should obey out of love. We should choose to gather together and meet with him out of love. We should love the things that he loves simply because we love him. We obey out of that great desire, just simplicity. And you know, we love God in response to his love for us, right? That's, that's what that verse so aptly describes back in 1 John. It says that in verse number 19, we love him because he first loved us. We didn't seek him first, he sought us first. In fact, it says that we, we all, like sheep, went astray, right? We went everyone into his own way. We, we didn't want him. We didn't want to seek the Lord, right? Uh, there is none that doeth good, the Bible says. No, not one. You ever, you ever have Joe Williams, and he'll ask you, how you doing? And you say, pretty good. And he's like, there's no man good, right? Yeah, that's, he's like, that's what the Bible says, you know, with his, with his accent. And I'm like, that is true, brother. That's true. You know, I, I just have to agree with him. And he's right. He's right. This doesn't, again, just beat us up. This just shows how good of a God we have. If I was some sort of catch, it would lessen God's love, wouldn't it? If I had something virtuous in me, that of course God would love me, but it's, it's more like, really, them? Him? Me? Have you ever had a friend that dated somebody, and you looked at that person and you're like, really? Really? Them? What is it that you see in them? Uh, we, we had a really awkward experience one time with one of our friends in college. We didn't even know he was dating somebody. This would have been in the early 2000s before people commonly dated online. And we had no idea that he was even seeing somebody. 
and he went off for a trip on a weekend, and he, and he got married. We didn't even know. His name was John, and he, he married um, this, this woman that none of us had ever met. I guess he met her over the internet, and they saw each other a couple of times, and then they flew to Hawaii together, met there in, in Hawaii, I should say. They got married on the beach by a guy dressed like a pirate. We have pictures to see it. And we're like, oh, you got married. No one saw, I mean, we, we hung out almost every week. We had no idea this was going on. And then he brought his bride to meet all of us. We went out to a restaurant together. We were all out in public. And all that they did the whole time was fight with each other in front of us in our whole peer group. And we're all just like, <laughs> great to meet her, John, thanks. Right, this was great. A little bit awkward, right? Maybe you thought that before and you're like, I don't know what you see in her. I don't know what you see in him. But you, you go for it. You love him. Okay. Okay. That's how, if there was anyone outside of us, would have responded had God looked at us and said, I'm going to give my son for them. The angels might have been like, really, them? I'm sure they didn't unless they were the third that fell. The others worshipped God and knew him too well. So... We live in this gratitude. We reciprocate because of what God has done. Remember, he's the initiator of our salvation. We didn't go to him with the problem and he's like, okay, I'll do something about it. No, he's the one who, before the foundation of the world, the Lord Jesus had already, in time, you know, eternity past, had already committed to give himself for us. He was the lamb who was slain before the foundation of of the world. He was already going to be that sacrifice for us all the way back then. God initiated it, not you and I. You even see it in the garden. If we were to go back to Adam and Eve and Adam and Eve sinned, who is it that comes looking for whom? Do Adam and Eve, back in the cool of the day, go to try and meet God and say, God, we messed up. We love you so much. We're so sorry. No, they were hiding and trying to cover up everything they did. And yet it was God who came to try and find them. And he was the one who covered their nakedness now that they were aware of that. And he was the one who gave them the skins. And he was the one who made the promise of a deliverer that would crush the serpent's head, though it, his heel would be bruised. God is the one who keeps coming back. Have you noticed that the children of Israel had this pattern where God would be good to them and then they'd forget him because life was so good? And then once they forgot him, They'd start to serve other gods and worship other gods and do despicable things, and God would remove his blessing from them, and then they'd get in a whole bunch of trouble. And who would come seeking back after them? The Lord. He'd send a prophet and tell them to return. He'd send somebody with a message in order to tell them to repent so that his blessing might come again. He'd send a judge, which was one of those military leaders that led the children of Israel during a period of time. It was a, a repeat of mankind rejecting God again and again and God coming out of love to try and bind up and save mankind. That's the Lord that we serve and we love him because he first loved us. Amen. Just some simple applications of this idea. Revisit the cross often. That's why we do this at the Lord's Supper. Because we remember the blood that was shed for us, the body that was broken for us. You see, nothing says how much the Lord loves us quite like Calvary does. Christ's sacrificial death for people that didn't deserve it is the greatest act of love that anyone has ever witnessed. Nothing reminds us of who God is better, and nothing reminds us of who we are better than what happened at the cross. It so greatly frames his love. Revisit the cross often. I know people that get bored when the pastor gets up and he preaches about salvation because they're already saved. They're like, I know all that. That's for lost people. I know some people that have said, I'm not going to come to morning church anymore because that's too geared towards people that don't know the Lord and you're always talking about Jesus and his resurrection. I'm going to come to Sunday night and Wednesday night to get the stuff that I, I need to hear. I would argue the further we get away from the cross, the more likely we are to think less of God and more of ourselves because we forget how we all entered into this. It, it wasn't because we were so great and clean living and dressed up and nice and faithful. It all started us with us being a wretch, needing to be saved, and God coming. And he was the hero of the story, never us. But the further we get from the cross, the more we start to think about, we, we won all those battles, not the Lord. We visit the cross often. 
The second thing is to dwell on God's love for you. Dwell on it. How do you dwell on something, right? You know what dwelling is in the, in the Bible sense? It means to pitch a tent there. It means to stay there for a while. It means to stay there. How many of you like to camp, right? How many of you like tent camping? You like tent camping, that's good. How many of you, you enjoy in a cabin? Cabin. How many of you, you like the Hilton? That's your idea of, of camping, okay, right, yeah. Yeah, I, I thought I loved camping, and then I realized I hated sleeping on the ground. As a kid, it never bothered me. My dad and I, we'd go camping all the time, and I loved it. And then I tried it again with my kids, and I'm like, this isn't as much fun as I remembered, <laughs> right? And we have to have all sorts of fancy blow-up mattresses, and yeah. And before you know it, you might as well have just stayed at the Hilton. It would have been cheaper by the time you buy all the gear. It means to dwell it means to stay there. You know, you, we should sing songs of God's love. It's just like his great love, right? Um, there's, there's so many wonderful hymns that we sing, and we sing them on purpose. The vast majority of churches today in our community, they, they will sing songs that are emotionally riling you up, that have a strong beat to them, that have a, a repetitive chorus that helps you work up into an emotional fervor, but oftentimes they teach very little doctrine. They don't teach you anything about the Lord. Oftentimes when you need a Bible verse and you can't think of it, you can think of a hymn that you sung in church that has the same truth of that that will come to you in just the right moment. In just the right moment. So there's a reason why we do what we do. Not because we don't, wanna, we don't know any better, it used to be that um, that was the cool thing, was to have the band and, and the smoke machines and the mirrors and the laser lights and all that. And now that's old hat. Did you know that? Everybody's already done that. They've already burned that out. And now people, you know, we get lost people that don't know the Lord that come to our church and they're like, oh, finally, a place that's a church. Isn't that interesting? You've got hymnals? What are these? We've never seen these before. It's like the experiment is completed and people have come full circle. They want something better. They're, they're tired of the cotton candy and, and they want something that actually comforts them and gives them what they need. That doesn't make us good. That just makes us blessed. It just makes us blessed. Sing songs of his love. Thank him daily. I hope that's the first thing you do when you wake up. Before you talk to anybody else, while you're still staring at the ceiling, that those first few thoughts are, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done to me. Thank you for your, your salvation, right? Okay, it could be your second thought. Your first thought is, where is my phone so I can shut off that alarm, right? And press the snooze button for the, the, the seventh time. That, that's what I think about. Then the second thing is the Lord. Count off the ways that he loves you and that he shows it. The last thing is, let's consciously serve God out of love. Let's do that. So when it's, when it's your turn to, to be in the nursery, to sing in the choir, to play the piano, to sing special music, to mow the grass, to blow the leaves, to paint a room, to whatever it might be, to work in junior church, to, to get out the Cheerios for the preschool snack, right? When you're doing that, remind yourself, in your own dialogue in your head, Lord, I'm doing this because I love you, because you first loved me. We could never repay it, but we can return the feeling as much as possible, and that feeling into action. Lord, I'm doing this because I love you. We love him because he first loved us. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes for a moment? A brief thought, a brief thought before we go to the Lord's Supper, but an important one. In just a moment, we are going to observe the Lord's Supper. And it's an important time. It's a time of reflection. It's a time of reflection. Let me ask you, has your, has your love for the Lord grown cold? I know I've gone through seasons of that. Sometimes it's so easy to love the Lord, and other times it's just dry and dead, and you feel like your prayers bounce off the ceiling, and what's the point in serving God anyway? In this time of invitation, I want to encourage you, ask the Lord to rekindle that love for you. Revisit in your mind all that God did to save us from our sin. Think of the eternity of torment that he saved us from. Think of the price that he gladly paid 
It says, for the joy that was set before him, Christ endured the cross. What joy is that? That you and I would be made the sons and daughters of glory? That he would bring us there? Have you forgotten about how much the Lord loves you because the situation in your life is hard right now? He'll never leave you nor forsake you, no matter what it is you're going through. He's proven himself to be faithful. And he's the one who started all of this. We're not holding on to him with our love. He's holding on to us with his love. And because he didn't do it, because we were good enough, we don't have to worry about losing it. As he talks about the children of Israel, he says, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. And you and I are the blessed beneficiaries grafted into that. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to know he loved you and he gave his son for you that you might be saved so that you don't perish but have everlasting life. Trust him tonight. Believe on the Lord. I was 18 years old when, by faith, I asked the Lord Jesus to forgive my sins and be my Savior. I wasn't in church. There wasn't a preacher there. I just knelt down at the side of my bed and I asked the Lord to forgive my sins and be my Savior because I believed that Jesus died and rose from the grave. If you've never prayed to receive the Lord, you can do it even now. Even if you're watching or listening online, the Lord will save you. Christian, as the songwriter said, oh, for grace to love him more. May God rekindle that in each of our hearts. Father, I pray that you would help us that we might love you not just in emotion or in word, but in action like you've done for us. Help us to live out of this gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen.